This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon! Can you hear me now? Good. When you talk about Nickelodeon, it's not long before you find yourself talking about animation. The cable channel is strongly associated with the animated programming, to the point that most modern criticism of the channel involves how the channel has pivoted away from animation towards live action sitcoms. That's a discussion for much, much later. But since the original three Nicktoons premiered in 1991, animation has been irreversibly linked to the channel's identity. Of course, it didn't really begin in 1991. Nickelodeon had been imported to animated programming for seven years by that point. Beginning in 1984, the channel slowly acquired a sizable roster of shows. Many of them Saturday morning also rans, but just as many fun, interesting shows from all around the world most of them not airing anywhere else in the United States. From an animation history standpoint, this put Nickelodeon into a very unique place in the cartoon landscape at this time. With the deregulation of the FCC by the Reagan administration, American animation on network television was pivoting very strongly toward programming designed to sell toys or other merchandise. 1984 in specific would see the premieres of the Transformers, My Little Pony, Challenge of the Gobots, Rainbow Bright, Snorks, Dragon's Lair, The Get Along Gang, Pole Position, and Muppet Babies. Yes, I love Muppet Babies too, but the merchandising sales for that show were quite substantial, and it would only get more extreme for the rest of the 1980s. Jerry Laybourne, at this point the temporary head of Nickelodeon, wasn't a fan of this. While not nearly the fuddy-duddy Cy Schneider was, Laybourne was very concerned about manipulative tactics aimed towards children in television, and the amounts of violence in these shows. She wasn't protesting the FCC, but she and Peggy Sharon were on a first-name basis. Laybourne was dedicated to creating a fun, exclusive place for young viewers, but Nickelodeon was not going to be compromised the same way the networks were. You could go further back, get reruns of animated shows before this Reagan administration, and they would do that from time to time, but instead of reruns, Laybourne opted to bring animation Nickelodeon with shows nobody had seen before, shows from outside of the country, essentially making Nickelodeon a multinational platform. Of course, we gotta ask, why did it take Nickelodeon five years to bring cartoons to the channel? Oh sure, they had cheaply licensed animated shorts peppered through the channel's various package shows like Pinwheel and Hocus Focus and By the Way, but even before the days of He-Man, it was a given that animated programming was big with kids. Sure, Nickelodeon didn't have the money to lease the Hanna-Barbera libraries, but you know what advantage it did have? It was owned by Warner Amex, aka Warner Brothers, aka the Looney Tunes guys, a huge library of famous and hilarious cartoons that had been mainstays of syndicated television since the 1950s. But they didn't go that route. In fact, Looney Tunes wouldn't air on Nickelodeon until after Warner Amex sold the channel to Viacom. It's kind of hilarious that Nickelodeon premiered in 1979 with a show featuring Warner Brothers comic books, but not Warner Brothers cartoons. But while there are no official statements from the people involved, I can guess why animation was avoided during the Cy Schneider era. Schneider was interested in his PBS You Pay For It model, and PBS didn't have any animation either. In fact, it wouldn't have animation for a very long time. The first fully animated PBS show was The Magic School Bus in 1994, which, wow, that's a lot more recent than I would have guessed. We know why, of course. PBS was funded by a hot water, cold water congress and essentially the first Patreon. It didn't have the leverage for animation, and unlike Nickelodeon, it couldn't import things because educational animated programming wasn't really a thing yet. Cy Schneider didn't have that excuse, but if PBS wasn't doing it, he probably wasn't going to be doing it either. So it would be up to Jerry Laybourne to open the door to animation. And in the summer of 1984, she would deliver a one-two punch of imported foreign programming. 
First, a British secret agent spoof starring anthropomorphic animals, and then a Japanese adventure series about a boy and his dog making a cross-country trip through France and Spain. We'll get to Danger Mouse next time, but for now, let's talk about Belle and Sebastian. Shh, listen carefully. Now you can watch the continuing adventures of Belle and Sebastian every weekday morning on Nick Jr. But if any of these guys find out that Belle and Sebastian are around, this dog is doomed. I'm gonna capture the white monster if it's the last thing I do. I want you to get that white dog. You have to get by me first. Belle, I promise I won't let anyone hurt you. Can Sebastian keep his promise? Find out on Belle and Sebastian, bright and early weekday mornings on Nick Jr. Sebastian is an adventurous young boy, living in the French mountains with Grandpa and his caretaker-slash-adoptive aunt, Anne-Marie. Sebastian's birth mother, Isabel, is a Romani woman who had to break away from her family and give birth up in the mountains. Unable to care for her infant son, she gave the boy to this nice French mountain family and disappeared across the border. Meanwhile, a large white female Pyrenees dog is wandering the area. While, in fact, a caring animal who tries to help out, her large size and fierce features gets her misunderstood as a dangerous animal, and soon the authorities and locals are hunting the dog. Sebastian and the dog cross paths in the mountain and make an immediate connection. The boy names the dog Belle, and they form a close bond. But when the law finally catches up, Sebastian must take a stand to protect his new friend. Ready? Aim! <sighs> Sebastian, don't be a fool! I won't let you shoot! I won't! You'll have to get by me first! Huh? Could Sebastian really prevent the soldiers from hunting down Bell? He wasn't sure, but at least he had learned that right now, this friendship was the most important thing in his life. With armed men at their heels, Sebastian, Bell, and, um, Poochie, who is theoretically also a dog, the three of them jump the border into Spain. Belle on the run for her life, and Sebastian in search for his mother. And also Poochie's there. As they travel, Belle and Sebastian meet many new people and find themselves having many wild adventures. One minute they're on the run from a couple of smugglers who want to capture and sell Belle. The next they're climbing up waterfalls to find a doctor who can help a sick little girl. Sebastian is a good-natured boy who believes in helping whenever he can. From tracking down sheep thieves to helping rebuild burnt down orphanages to pretending to be a ghost to spook criminals on a ship. Tell me who you are. There's no such thing as ghost. Don't come any further, I'll shoot. But no matter how many good deeds the boy and his dog do, they are being constantly pursued by law enforcement. Belle is still being called a dangerous, vicious animal, the white monster terrorizing the countryside. And Sebastian has entered the country illegally. And as if the cops weren't bad enough, many shady individuals are also trying to catch the two of them, either because they believe the hype, that Belle is violent, or because they want to collect the reward. So, Belle and Sebastian can never stay in one place for too long. They have to outpace their reputations, be wary of strangers, and keep glancing over their shoulders for police cars. Isabel has been living the last couple of years as a performer for a traveling circus troupe, which means we're five for five for these outdoor adventure shows prominently featuring clowns. Catch! <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> oh. 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 I give up! Oh, I'm getting out of here! At the halfway point of the series, Sebastian and his mother almost meet, come within a few miles of each other. The circumstances separate them again. Isabel, who loves her son and now thinks she has the resources to go see him again, starts heading north towards France, which means Sebastian has to do a U-turn to make his way back home. And here we see Sebastian's good deeds pay off, as those people whom he've helped start helping him catch up with his mother and avoid the police. 
Running for one 52 episode season, Bell and Sebastian has a very strong continuity. Our protagonists often find themselves hanging around a group of characters for three or four episodes, with many of these characters returning later on, especially Sarah, the sick girl I mentioned earlier, becoming Sebastian's closest friend and ally for this journey. No episode can really said to be filler, but the show goes out of its way to make sure that anyone entering partway into the story isn't lost. Episodes begin with pretty extensive previously on segments, with a narrator letting you all know the pertinent details. Rolo stole away with all Sebastian's money from a bag around Belle's neck. When Sebastian discovered the theft, he followed Rolo, not only to get his money back, but also to find his mother with Carlo's company. More than that, though, Belle and Sebastian use a lot of flashback sequences, characters remembering previous events, then cutting to a scene from an older episode. It never overwhelms the episode, it never goes full-blown clip show, and when you're reintroducing characters you last saw 40 episodes ago, it can come in handy, especially when you're a kid watching only one episode a weekday and not an adult marathoning the show for a YouTube documentary show. For a show so serialized, it's very new viewer friendly, and I greatly appreciate that. In fact, while it has a lot to offer for the continuity stands out there, Bell and Sebastian works a lot better watched casually than it does through binge watching. This is the inherent flaw when it comes time for me to rewatch shows for review. Shows wouldn't be made for binging for another 30 years, and watching a dozen half hour episodes a day betrays how repetitive the show can be. Oh no, Sebastian is being terrorized by wolves! For the third time! So many episodes ends with Belle saving a guest character, and then that character realizing, oh, this dog is actually brave and sweet and helpful and I shouldn't have judged her by her appearance. Which is a good lesson, don't get me wrong, but sometimes it feels like the show's only lesson, taught the same way over and over again. Of course it's not. Sebastian himself is meant to be an aspirational character. While not a flawless kid, He's stubborn and a few times makes assumptions about people the same way people make assumptions about him and Belle. He is also incredibly brave, putting himself out there to help people to the best of his abilities. He believes in earning his keep. Anytime he stays with someone, he insists on doing chores and helping them out. And he has an aspirational level of empathy. He's always trying to understand people and their problems. As a kid, he doesn't have all the tools to make it work, but he always tries. In one episode, Sebastian finds himself the hostage to a bank robber, but instead of escaping or defeating him, Sebastian goes out of his way to try and understand the robber, find out why he's doing this. He gives the robber some of his food, and then we discover that the robber is sick. Are you alright? What can I do for you? Oh, it's my heart, it's my heart. Oh. Well, what should I do? Tell me! What should I do for you? Tell me! I'll do anything you say! The medicine. I ran out of the medicine. I need it. Oh. Medicine? There's a drugstore right near here, so I'll go and get the medicine for you. No, you're just trying to escape from me. Tell me the truth. You don't have to worry. I promise that I'll come back soon. No way! I don't believe you. So Sebastian ends up tying a note to Pucci and tells him to get to the nearby pharmacy for medicine. This is an exceptionally brave episode for Pucci, as there's an aggressive cat outside the pharmacy that could probably swallow Pucci whole. While not every criminal on the show gets redeemed on this level, the fact that this kids show presents empathy for lawbreakers at all is kind of amazing. While there are some genuinely bad criminals that cross Bell and Sebastian's paths, nine times out of ten it's law enforcement that are the antagonists. The show has a lot of cops, from bumbling local police to highly professional and militarized units, and all of them are a threat to Bell and Sebastian's safety. This show has a jailbreak storyline where Sebastian teams up with his mother's old Romani family to cut the power to the town so that they can get into the jailhouse and save Belle from execution by lethal injection. Holy crap. Most of the law enforcement characters are of a shoot first, ask questions later variety. Some of them are bloodthirsty bastards. Some of them are good people just following orders and when they realize that Sebastian is a good person and Belle is a gentle, helpful dog, they often disobey orders and help the two of them escape. 
Some of them straight up leave the force. The show's most iconic example is Inspector Garcia. We meet him early on, one of the two officers in a sleepy little villa where nothing ever happens. He is desperate for recognition, for promotion, and when Bell and Sebastian come to his town, he sees this as his big break. Now I'll be promoted to detective at headquarters. Don't you think so, Martin? Mm-hmm. Most well, certainly. The fearless Detective Garcia will finally see big city action. <laughs> now I can leave this hick town that doesn't even have crime. I'm raring to go. <laughs> the boy and his dog keeps out of Garcia's grass, and soon their good deeds start to leave an impact on the inspector. By the end of the show, Garcia's failure to catch Bell and Sebastian has left him demoted and ridiculed by other law enforcement. But more than that, he can really see that this chase, all these attempts to capture and arrest and kill these two, are wrong. And so, at the end of the series, in an act that ends his career, he stops his police car on a narrow bridge, keeping the rest of law enforcement from following the boy and his dog. Why do we have to treat the both of them so cruelly? That's what I'd like to understand. Because it's my sworn duty as a policeman. Hey! What's the matter with your car? Go ahead, chase them. We're losing time. We're going to lose it. Come on, chase them. Martin, I've decided to quit. Yeah? Whether it's my duty or not, I just cannot arrest Bell and Sebastian. If there are three lessons to learn from this show, it's 1. Don't judge people by their appearance, 2. Try your best to understand people and their problems, and 3. Don't be a cop. Never ever be a cop. You can't be a good person and a cop at the same time. Don't be a cop. <sighs> so I should probably address the elephant in the room. No, the Scottish band Bell and Sebastian was not named after the animated show. They were named after the live action show, which in turn was adapted from the book. Sort of, we'll get to that. Bell et Sebastian was published in 1965 and was written by French actress, screenwriter, and director Cecil Aubrey. After a successful but brief career in Hollywood, Aubrey retired in 1959, claiming that she was only interested in making movies for the travel opportunities. After getting married, Aubrey pivoted towards writing and producing French television, specifically French television for her son, Mendy El Glaoui, to star in. First came 1961's Polly, about a boy's relationship with a cute little pony from a traveling circus. It's easy to see the Bell and Sebastian DNA in the show, the young boy and animal relationship and the sleepy French villas, all that good stuff. Then came Bell and Sebastian the show, and the book coming out in 1965. Both were in production at the same time, so it's really a tie-in book as opposed to a book the show is based on. It's funny because Bell and Sebastian feels like one of those timeless Heidi-esque European children's stories, but it's A, younger than my parents, B, a multimedia franchise, and C, the result of nepotism. Aubrey just wanted to give her little guy his own TV show. For the record, the animated Japanese Bell and Sebastian is very different from the original French version. First off, the book takes place in the Alps along the border of Italy, not the Pyrenees Mountains along the border of Spain. This surprised me. Bell is a great Pyrenees, a dog bred in the Pyrenees Mountains, and I figured there was a connection. Sebastian's mother actually dies in childbirth in the book, and Bell and Sebastian don't go on the epic quest to find her. They never leave the mountains, they never cross the border. In the animated show, pretty much everything between episodes 4 and 50 are original to the story. Also, there's no Poochie in the original. No little goblin to spit in the face of God. The original live-action series got exported to a lot of different countries, including an English dub version in the United Kingdom in 1967, and this is reportedly the version that the band took their name from. I don't know how this is allowed, how you can just take a name from a TV show and use it for your own band? The original Bell and Sebastian isn't in the public domain or anything. Like, I don't know French trademark laws, but my attempts to Google the show ended up getting the band, and that would seem like a major conflict of interest. 
It was certainly a pain researching for this video. Well, if you can't beat them. Hi, this is my new band Goof Troop. We play soft music about going on dates in the rain and ruin your searches for episodes of Goof Troop. But let's get away from Europe and instead fly over to Japan, where in 1973, the live action Bell and Sebastian show aired on NHK, Japan's National Public Broadcasting Service. Oh boy, it's time. It's time to talk about the Japanese entertainment industry and anime. Nothing monolithic and intimidating about that. <sighs> okay, Greg, breathe. We got this. Television is largely a post-World War II invention, and with its defeat and occupation, Japan found itself years behind other countries like the United States and Britain in terms of production infrastructure and resources, with the first public television broadcast in Japan not happening until 1953, and it would only broadcast for a handful of hours a day for a few years. To fill in time, a lot of television from the US and UK were translated and imported, beginning in 1955 with cartoons like the Flesher Brothers Superman shorts, Popeye, Huckleberry Hound, and the Flintstones. <laughs> Animation was more attractive to young audiences than live action, and cartoons were easier to dub. But soon enough, live action shows for adults would come over. Shows like Dragnet, Hopalong Casty, and The Adventures of Superman being some of the first television an entire generation of Japanese citizens consumed. And as such, Western television would have some influence on the style and content of original Japanese productions, including their animated productions. Arguably the most famous example of this in anime is the Japanese dubbed version of the sitcom Bewitched being a major point of inspiration for Sally the Witch a 1966 animated show that is considered by many to be the first in the magical girl genre of anime. I can't say how popular and influential the 1973 broadcast of Bell and Sebastian was, but somebody must have thought it was a recognizable enough story to produce an animated adaptation eight years later. Part of the reason behind the anime getting greenlit was probably a trend towards what I'll call Eurocentric anime. That is, animated shows that involve European stories with European characters taking place in Europe. The centerpiece of this trend was World Masterpiece Theater, a collection of yearly one-season animes produced primarily by Nippon Animation that, with the exception of the very first one in 1969, were all adaptations of Western children's literature. Anne of Green Gables, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, A Dog of Flanders, Moomin, works like that. World Masterpiece's big breakout was 1974's Heidi, Girl of the Alps, which was so popular that it's a major reason the French Alps are still a frequent destination for Japanese tourists. It's also notable as an early pre-studio Ghibli collaboration between Isao Takahata and Hayao Miyazaki. The story of World Masterpiece Theater is a video unto itself, but the important thing to take away from this is that it was still popular going into the 1980s and it might be worth doing our own Eurocentric anime to cash in on the trend, preferably a story that the Japanese audience may already have a relationship with. What's that? We have adaptation rights to Bell and Sebastian? Well, let's make an anime for that. Maik and Julie, aka Bell and Sebastian the anime, Bell is named Julie in the Japanese version, originally premiered on NHK on April 7th, 1981, replacing The Wonderful Adventures of Nils, another Eurocentric anime. Bell and Sebastian was produced by three studios. First was MK Company, the MK standing for Mitsuru Kaniko, who is perhaps better known for his other company, Japan Computer Graphics Lab, an innovator in early 1980s CGI and its incorporation into Japanese animation. Previous MK Company works include, and I'm going to refer to these shows by their English names because I can't even pronounce most English words correctly, Jungle Tales, Star of the Sain, and Marco Polo's Adventures. But you'd probably be more interested in what they did after Bell and Sebastian. You know, just a little show we'll be covering one day called Mysterious Cities of Gold. 
The next studio is Visual 80, which is primarily known for doing overseas work on American productions like The Real Ghostbusters, Mask, and Spiral Zone. Largely doing grunt work in between animation, Visual 80 doesn't exactly have a reputation for high quality work. Bell and Sebastian appears to be their first credit. And finally, the big one, Toho. Primarily a film company, Toho is most famous for creating Godzilla and the larger kaiju franchise. They had gotten into television in the early 70s, but predominantly live-action tokusatsu shows, special effects heavy productions that leaned into what they were famous for, people in monster costumes fighting. Bell and Sebastian would be their first animated production. On paper, this all seemed like a recipe for disaster. A trend-chasing animated show being created by a guy who focuses on computer-generated animation, but there's no CGI in the show, a grunt work company with a poor reputation, and a live-action monster movie studio working in animation for the first time in a genre they're not known for. All from a source material created because a French actress wanted to give her son a TV show for his birthday. And yet, not only is Belle and Sebastian not a disaster, it's pretty dang good. It definitely had good talent behind it. This was a show made to compete with World Masterpiece Theater, and specifically to recapture the magic of Heidi, Girl of the Alps. So the production grabbed Kiji Hayakawa, who had been the assistant director on Heidi, to be the show director and storyboard artist for Bell and Sebastian. With Heidi in mind, it kind of makes sense relocating the story to the Pyrenees Mountains. Keeping it in the Alps might get you called copycats. And if you're doing a journey story and you're starting at the Pyrenees Mountains, that means you're probably going into Spain. The animation for Bill and Sebastian is pretty standard for this time. A lot of start and stop action with pretty simplified character designs. You know, functional, but not award winning. That's still a lot of work, mind you. The first episode is said to have had 12,000 animation cells. The real visual creativity went into the environments and select set pieces. Gorgeous sunsets, sun-baked beaches, snowy mountaintops, and lots of open fields with grass swaying in the wind. The France and Spain seen in the show have an idyllic, almost fairy tale like quality to them. A world of quiet little villas, crumbling medieval ruins, and turn-of-the-century fashions and automobiles. It's entirely removed from the real-world history and politics that would have been keeping people occupied during that time. Things like, you know... Germany. It's an outsider, touristy version of early 20th century Europe. In fact, the production took a month-long trip to Europe, taking a lot of pictures of older architecture to use as a visual reference, but didn't seem to pick up much of the history that that architecture represented. And that's perfectly fine. It's not some great disservice that the show ignores the Rift War and the rise of the Second Spanish Republic. That's not the point. Spain is just a name of a place. What matters is the aesthetic, the quaint wood cabins and towering stone monasteries. An old world for kids of the 80s to imagine adventures in. The final episode aired on June 22, 1982, and work on getting it dubbed and exported to other countries soon went underway. Being a Eurocentric work, it was an easy show to sell to Western audiences, and in 1984, it would find a home in the United States on Nickelodeon. Bell and Sebastian are coming your way, next on Nickelodeon. What makes the Nickelodeon version so interesting is that the channel took it upon themselves to do the English localization. This is going to prove rare. Most Japanese imports on the channel would be localized by third parties, usually Haim Saban. But for this first go-around, they did it themselves. The English language script was done by Eileen Opetet, who you may remember as the manager of acquisitions in charge of finding things to air on Special Delivery. In fact, Bell and Sebastian would make their Nickelodeon premiere as a part of Special Delivery before becoming part of regular programming. The English dub was recorded by Synchro Quebec out of Montreal. And it's not a bad dub. Characters talk a little bit faster than what's natural, but I've seen worse. However, something happened partway through production that required some of the voices to be recast, most notably the bumbling smuggler duo Hernandez and Fernandez. Halfway through the show, they suddenly just have completely different voices. So, wise guy, now what are you going to do with them? 
He looks like a smart boy, Hernandez. What if he suspects what we're really doing here? That we're actually smugglers, then what? <laughs> Don't talk so loud, you idiot, when he hears you. You shouldn't be angry with us. Look, we have the keys to let you out of this place. That's right, and we'll get lots of reward money when we bring you into the police station and tell them that we've got the real live weight lunch. You dummy, you talk too much. There's more songs in the Japanese version, including the opening and closing theme, performed by Mitsuko Hori, a voice actress and singer who did a lot of anime themes in the 60s until pretty much now. The Nickelodeon version opts to open with the instrumental version, which makes sense, Japanese lyrics and all, but it does mean we do miss out on a bunch of children making burr noises. <laughs> Bell and Sebastian is something of a small miracle. Going behind the scenes reveals a meal that's a lot more processed than it tastes, a show that was a result of marketing forces and nepotism, and yet it has so much heart, charm, beauty, and excitement in anti-cop rhetoric that it feels so much more than a corporate product. I mean, all television is corporate product. The trick is hiding it. And Bell and Sebastian does it very well at hiding it. The show would run on Nickelodeon for five years, ending in 1989. It's You Can Jump in Anywhere format, letting it have a good shelf life in reruns. And its success would open the doors for many other Japanese productions to find their home on Nickelodeon. There have been a number of foreign language DVD releases across the world, and the show's been rerun a number of times on Japanese television. But right now, the English version of Bell and Sebastian has not seen any home video release. Thankfully, all of the Nickelodeon episodes were collected by the tape trader circuit, and people have gone out of their way to rip the audio of these recorded VHS tapes and pair them with higher quality non-English DVD sources. Dedicated fans have done a lot of work to keep this show preserved, and as of this recording, the entire English language show is available on YouTube. Bell and Sebastian had other adaptations as well. Two live-action French films in 2013 and 2015 that focuses a bit more on the real-world history of 1940s Europe, and a Canadian-French co-produced animated series in 2017, which also ran for one 52-episode season. While not directly connected to the older series, the character design of Sebastian does seem to bear a strong resemblance to the anime version. If I can speak personally, Bell and Sebastian represents the beginning of the Nickelodeon that I am nostalgic for. The era of positive, wholesome foreign animation with a fun fairy tale attitude towards things. Bell and Sebastian would open the doors for David the Gnome, Little Koala, Maya the Bee, Grimm's fairy tale classics, The Mysterious Cities of Gold, The Little Bits, and so much more. I, I love the Nicktoons. They were revolutionary for animation in multiple ways. But for me personally, when I think of Nickelodeon, it's sitting in front of the TV, wrapped in a blanket, a bowl of Skittles at my feet, watching programs like Bell and Sebastian. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Next time. We traveled across the Pacific, now we cross the Atlantic for the adventures of the world's greatest and the world's tiniest action hero. Today's research shoutout goes to the Anime Encyclopedia by Jonathan Clements and Helen McCarthy. When the internet becomes self-aware and escapes to the moon, it's reference books like these that we'll rely on. But more than that, I want to thank a few people who helped me in my research. First, Aaron Cerise, a wonderful anime YouTuber who helped me find a number of Japanese magazine scans from 1981, which was critical as there's very little behind-the-scenes information on Bell and Sebastian on the English-speaking web. If you like chronological looks at television, Aaron has a great series on the history of magical girl anime. That's where I learned that tidbit about Bewitched. You should go check it out. Second is Akumatsu Translations, who translated those magazine scams, and I could not be any more grateful. Thank you two so much, I couldn't have done it without you. If you'd like to help Knickknacks, perhaps consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to research, production values, and keeping the lights on. You can also support Knickknacks and the Pop Arena by subscribing to the channel, hitting that bell icon for notifications, hitting that like button, sending a one-time donation through Coffee, 
following me on Twitter, or sharing knickknacks with all your friends. We made it! Animation is here! Share the video! Share!